Okay, so as we're talking about cinematography, one thing I want to draw your attention to is how in um, web series there is, well, and in all filming, there is a certain language that becomes associated with that particular genre. And in web series, cinematography tends to feature a lot of these um, mid medium close ups that are also accompanied with frontality. And what I think is one of the things that's fascinating about the guild, and that I want you to continue paying attention to, is how you can differentiate between the conversations that are supposed to be between Codex, the character, and the audience, where she's breaking the fourth wall and using frontality, and the cinematographer uses a medium close-up shot of her from scenes that were supposed to be the fly on the wall that use classic Hollywood editing um, and oblique framing and avoids frontality. And so it becomes a kind of language where when you're watching any kind of show that the audience picks up on even though it's pretty subtle and you may not have the vocabulary for it. But now we are getting the vocabulary to describe these things, which is power. Something that I love. Um, one thing that I do want to show you, this is a little bit of foreshadowing some um, terminology that we're going to be reading more about next week with editing. But here with the framing, you can see that we have um, the annotation that says this baby point of view is a masterful angle that director Sean Becker threw in on the set. And so what this means is um, that they put the camera at a lower angle than normal. And so that would actually be called low angle because it's shooting up at the object in order to convince us, the audience, that this shot of Clara is coming from the perspective of her child, who is, of course, shorter than she is. So, again, as you're watching videos and as you are preparing to shoot your own videos, you start thinking about how you need to carefully plan out even the camera placement so that you can tell bits of the story um, visually by just choosing where your audio, where your camera goes. Now, also this brings us back to rate. We talked earlier in the earlier video about how rate makes us, um, if you slow down the rate and actually shoot at a faster speed so that when it plays back it appears to be slow, um, can make us look glamorous. You can also use a slower rate in order to portray something as horrific and slow down so that you can see all the details. And in this particular scene, which is one of my favorite scenes, makes me laugh out loud, um, where Clara is in a race against her children um, and they're laughing at her, we get this great annotation that says it was inspired by a YouTube video. So this is an homage to something that Felicia had seen on YouTube, but also the slower rate makes Clara's race against her children even more intense. Um, so you can use slow motion not just to make your subjects appear more glamorous, but also to increase tension. And again, this is important to always be thinking about not just what we see, okay, we see slow motion, but what is significant about it? Does it make the subject appear more glamorous? Does it make us uh, able to see some of the cool tricks that they're doing? Does it make the tension in the scene more heightened? You know, what is the effect, basically, of the this cinematographer's choice? Now, also, I, I'm just calling attention to this screenshot because I like the annotations um, that, again, remind us that what is happening with videos is and with filmmaking is that oftentimes we're creating an illusion that something is happening that is not. And I do like the, just the fact that this annotation from season two tells us that Felicia, the actress who plays Codex, was not actually naked on set. So just a reminder that what we're dealing with here are texts that have been specifically written and structured and set up in a way to fool us, the audience, into believing that it's real life and it's continuous and the things that we think we're seeing are actually happening. But 
that a lot of it is actually technical know-how and there's a serious amount of forethought that goes into the staging and production of these images. Now also want to bring attention to this particular shot from season two where we are outside of Bork's house. Um, obviously this is a, a shot, it's, it's known as an establishing shot, we're going to be learning about that next week, but this is a long shot um, so that we can see the entire outside of Bork's house and also the mise-en-scene gives us a clue that this is not supposed to be a affluent neighborhood and actually is a neighborhood that's quite dangerous. Now, again, as viewers, we know that there was a crew that was tasked with taking probably all of their trash from lunch and throwing it onto the front yard. Um, but as somebody who's viewing the series as it's going along, the suitcase coupled with the house, coupled with the overgrown um, trees and bushes and shrubbery and all of the trash um, helps to establish not only that this is a lower income um, neighborhood that's also probably quite dangerous, but that we have, we're watching, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm blanking here. We're watching Zabu move into the house um, and that this is Bork's house. And so he tells us something about his character. All of these images are building more and more information. And next we're going to have a cut in closer to the scene where we see more of what's happening um, between the characters. And then we'll have a better assessment of where they are in the story, which is probably they're quite scared and want to get inside of Bork's house. And also that Bork lives in a bad neighborhood. Now this, again, back to angle of framing. Um, as is pointed out on the Yale website, angle of framing, especially an example like this where it's a high angle of framing, can be used to show um, a character's vulnerability in a scene. It can also just be an angle such as this one that is supposed to really emphasize the act of Codex walking upstairs. And so sometimes you have to be careful to make sure that you're not reading too much into a particular scene. Sometimes the angle of framing is not to show dominance or that a character is vulnerable. Um, but just simply to set up a perspective, basically like an establishing shot, so that we can see, by contrast to the last image that we saw, that Codex, even though she's unemployed, must have a certain amount of money um, because she has this nice complex that she lives in, where there's a container to hold the hose, that they have these nice flowers, um, there is what appears to be possibly artificial grass. <laughs> um, but that is well maintained. And so this is, again, to set up a contrast between Bork's environment and Codex's environment, and not necessarily meant to show at all that she's vulnerable in this scene. So you do have to be careful in how you're analyzing and, and figuring out the significance of a cinematographer's choices that they make. Now here we do have, again, another example of where Codex is being shot from a high angle, where the camera is placed above her, and shooting down her and she's not she's kind of vulnerable in this scene but also a lot of times you see this in conversations again we'll be talking about the shot reverse shot um, next week when we're discussing editing but here we're seeing a conversation between codex and vork and the camera is lined up to show vork looking down on codex and codex looking up at vork Yes, she is a little bit vulnerable. Yes, she wants inside of his house. Yes, she wants outside of the, da the dangerous neighborhood. Um, but also, it's important to note that this is just what's known as an eyeline match, where we're seeing the world from the perspective of the character. Um, and in this case, Fork. You can see Fork's shoulder here. And we're supposed to think that this is what Codex would look like when he's looking down to her because... He is taller, he's in a doorway, she's on the steps, she's waiting to come in, and yes, she is vulnerable. So this is this is sort of one of those moments where um, the camera angle not only mimics reality, he's taller, he's in a position of power, but also helps to communicate a certain emotional truth about this scene where um, Bork is in power and Codex really wants to get inside that house. Now, here we have a, an example of a close-up 
and this is of Blade's hands holding on to scooping up the uh, jelly beans that are going to be used in the in the card game as um, money, I guess you could say. And also need to be thinking about as we're constructing narratives and watching narratives that are visual in nature, that close-ups can help to communicate information quickly to the audience about what it is that we are to be focusing on. And in this particular case, it's kind of funny, right? That we have these grown men who are playing cards with jelly beans that they're using as currency, and they have all the jelly beans, and yet Vork is very upset about them. So this close-up, again, emphasizes the sort of the superfluity of jelly beans. We have a ton of jelly beans, and Vork is still worried about waste. So we have this um, extreme close-up of the jar. We have the close-up of the hands holding the jelly beans, and this is still not enough. Vork gets obsessed with the math and can't enjoy the game, and which is, again, ironic and should make you laugh. <laughs> now here we have an extreme close-up, and I wanted to use an, a, this as an example of an extreme close-up because oftentimes you're going to find shots that seem to fall between distinctive categories. Is this a close-up? Is it an extreme close-up? Is it a long shot? Um, but this is an extreme close-up of the timer, and we can tell it's an extreme close-up of the timer because it is cut off, it's truncated, um, and it's a relatively small object. This is also an example, again, of deep space. We have blades in the background, we have the jelly beans in the midground, we have the timer in the foreground, um, and so this is deep space, but shallow focus. Only the timer is in focus. It's the only one that you can see crisply and cleanly. And so again, this is an example of how um, cinematography can be used in order to persuade the audience to look at one particular item within a shot and not waste their time glancing around the other things that are not important at this moment. At this moment in the story, the timer is what is most significant. So that is it. I am going to stop this video and next start the video that explains how to do a screen capture um, so that you can complete your assignment for this week on cinematography.